trying to reconnect. There we go. Hi, it's Rob. Uh, I'm being interviewed by uh, Chris, Chris Rodwell. Hello, everyone. Uh, from Escape the Rat Race podcast. And we thought we might, we're, we're doing a live podcast with a live video, so we thought we might as well go live as well. So Chris has just asked me about leveraging, about fitting in tasks, about outsourcing. Many of Chris's listeners, you know, they're sort of just trying to sort of set up and scale up their own business. Now, um, leverage is probably my favourite word in the dictionary. Uh, and there's a lot of people out there that say that to be successful, you have to work hard, 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 hard. And I disagree with that. Because if you work hard, 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 um, what about your family? What about your children? Do you want them to leave home not knowing who their parents are? Also, you get to the point in a day where if you work too hard, you then start making bad decisions, you get tired, you get emotional, maybe angry, maybe you, know, you push people away. So actually, working smart is as, is as important as working hard. Um, so leverage is about working not just hard, but working smart. So number one is, who else can I get to do this task rather than how do I do this task? Um, we were just talking before about having partners and maybe even staff, outsourcers, who have the strengths to your weaknesses and vice versa. So I used to think, oh, I've got to do this job or how do I do this job or I don't want to do this job. Now I've retrained my brain to ask, who can I get to do this job? So I always say I, I outsource so much that even my business partner, Mark Homer, does all my worrying for me. <laughs> I've outsourced worry to him. He can worry day and night and, and have sleepless nights about everything, which he does. No point me doing it too, because that's what he does. Did you is, want to jump in? Yeah, I was just going to ask, is that your first question now, always who can I get yeah. to do this, first and foremost? Yeah, right. yeah, it is. And it's not because I'm a lazy bastard, and it's not because I'm trying to shirk responsibility. Because some, sometimes if I say, who should I get to do this? The answer is, I should. Mm. If I've got a customer that's loyal to my company and is not getting the service that they want, and they've, had a, they've tried to get in touch with our team and it's not worked out, I'll pick up the phone. Uh, and and I, I spend you know, a good one to two hours a day looking after my customers, community members, followers and fans in some way or other. So sometimes who can I get to do it is me, because I'm the right person. But admin, coding, you know, analysis, research, CRM, data mining, finance, accounts, processes, systems, is not my skill set, it's not my flow. If I do it, it'll take me ten times as long as someone who can do it, and I'll mess it up. So that's like a thought process. It's almost like a mindset. Because many people in England, and especially in the north of England, and especially with our current hard, our uh, um, previous hard-working generation of family, because our, you know, our, our family didn't have internet. They didn't really have anything to leverage. Our, our parents couldn't go on people per hour or Upwork or 99 Designs and outsource. So they had to do that all themselves. So you know, their skill was working hard and being relentless and their ethic. But the world's different now. And I'm not saying you don't have to work hard enough. Sorry, you shouldn't work hard. But you have to work hard enough so that you don't have to work hard, um, if you can get, make any sense of that. Um, I'm not saying you don't have to work hard. I, I'm, I'm saying that you've got so much opportunity now to get help, to leverage, to outsource. Um, and a lot of people will say things to me like, well, you know what, Rob, I've tried stuff and it didn't work out and I'll do it myself. But that's like going out on a few dates and having a girlfriend or a boyfriend, it not working out and going, oh, well, I'm never going to do that again. I'll stay single and lonely for the rest of my life. <clears throat> you know, even when we're really scarred, I'm going to have some moments single and then you're lonely. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a mindset. And also there's a lot of guilt. You know, like if you haven't done 10 hours hard work a day and you get to the end of the day and you think, I didn't really do much, I only did an hour. There's this like guilt, so a societal based guilt. Because, every, you know, a, a lot of these American uh, influencers that you follow or a lot of our parents, it's like work hard, work hard, work mm -hmm. hard, work hard. Um, I know I've got about three, maybe four highly productive hours in the day. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the time, it, I should be doing things that don't need my full attention and focus. And for me, that's what, 6.15 till about 8.30, and then I get another little spike at about 11.30 till about 1. The rest of the time, I'm on 50 or 60 or 70%, and after 6 o'clock, I'm on about 1%, where I'm, I'm basically just dribble-worthy, and that's it. Yeah. So um, you've got to change the mindset. Now, if I can get a design done by you on 99designs for 
50 quid. And that takes you an hour. Me getting a design not as good might take me a day or two days. And the time opportunity cost might have cost me 500 quid. So you've got to think about time opportunity cost of what you're doing so that what you couldn't be doing. An example of my new book, Start Now, Get Perfect Later. If I tried to design the cover, um, you know, like I, could, I, I used to be a, a, an architect and I used to be an artist. I could probably make some nice fancy designs and sketches, um, but it might take me a couple of days. Now, a couple of days might be 15 chapters of my book. Now, I make hundreds of thousands of pounds out of every book. So for every five or ten chapters I can't write, I'm much further away from making that money. But someone on 99 Designs can do that for 100 quid. Or my two designers in there, I've basically given the two designers a competition to come up with the best design. So, question on that. For someone who isn't as far down the line as you are at the moment, Rob, who is still educating themselves in that entrepreneurial mindset, how do you value your time? Do you have an equation for someone who's moving out of, of employment? So it's very clear you work, you know, your fixed hours, you get paid yeah. your X amount at the end of the month. Something people don't talk about is when you start a business and then suddenly you're the boss of you. You've got to work out yeah. what the most important tasks are. Yeah, I think you need to be ruthlessly efficient on this. Uh, and in my book, Life Leverage, I have a calculation called IGT, mm -hmm. which is income generating time which is your gross revenue per month divided by your hours worked per month. And if you work out your um, wage and hours weekly, then it's gross revenue weekly divided by number of hours worked. So if you earn a thousand pounds a week and you work 10 hours a week, you're worth a hundred pound an hour. I.e., Every hour of worked time that is worth a hundred pound to you. So every, every activity, function, task, project that, do, that, that, that doesn't or might not bring in more than 100 quid, you must outsource it, otherwise it brings your hourly value down. Uh, and if it could make you 2,000 or 5,000, like having a you know, meeting with Lord Sugar or some kind of you know, joint venture proposal or looking to maybe sell your business or going to raise finance, then that should or could be you. Now, what you find is if you work out your calculations, so everyone should do this. If you're um, listening or watching the live, do it right now. Just work out roughly what you work per week or month uh, in terms of hours and work out the gross revenue. So the revenue from worked income, passive income, you know, assets that you have, um, all income except loans or gifts that should be factored in. So I'll give you another. I'll just give you another example. Thousand pound a week, 10 hours a week, you're worth 100 quid. A week now once you start outsourcing 10 pound tasks your value goes up 100 150 200 pounds now what a lot of people do is 10 pound tasks when they could be doing a hundred pound or a thousand pound or fifty thousand pound tasks um, and I found it was Perry Marshall who taught me to do a work log for a couple of weeks note down every sort of 15 to 30 minute chunks of time what I was doing I sent it to me red penned it saying low value low value low value low value low value taught me 80 20 principle um, and then he put, look, this, if you're a property investor, viewings, high value, raising finance, high value, managing your portfolio, high value, dealing with tenants, low value, doing inventories, low value, redecorating and refurbing the houses, low value. And then, you know, you've got your hourly rate worked out. You work out the three or four or five high value key result area tasks. You do more of them. You outsource everything else. It costs you a £10 to outsource that task. That task that earns you 100 therefore goes up and up and up because you don't have to do 10 pound tasks which, which brings your average down um, and so it compounds upwards. So, so it's kind of like a, an algorithmic way of making decisions to know the value of your time. And you will hear really wealthy people say things like, it's not worth my time, it's not worth my time, it's not worth my time. And kind of poor people think, oh, when I look at this person, it's not worth my time, it's beneath them. But they're not saying it because they're above you, they're saying it because... They can, they can earn £50,000 in an hour's meeting. A property investor who views and gets a deal done on a property can make a lot of money in that viewing. Yeah. Um, whereas if they're doing their own tax returns or paperwork or whatever, then they, they can't earn any money. Yeah. Yeah. So that would lead me on then to the next question of when someone has followed your advice there, Rob, and they're, they're, they're really clear on what their, their time is worth, and now they're generating money, more money from their part-time job, business, mm. than their full-time 
when is the right time to quit? And I know that you've covered Ooh. this. When is the right time to quit? <laughs> and, okay. And yeah. this is obviously based on, on an individual's, you know, what, what they want out okay. of it. Do they? Yeah. yeah so I'll let so you the, go. For the it. right time for me to quit was when I got fired. <laughs> so I've, been, I've had two jobs in my life and I got fired three times. So I'm, I'm, I must have a world record in that as well. Uh, so there are different ways to quit your job. So I'm going to go through the different steps and we'll, we'll, then we'll, um, we'll make this the final one on the live feed because, you know, I want to get this out to your followers as well. So the first thing you've got to think is, should you actually quit? Because escaping the rat race isn't escaping a job you love to do because you're not in the rat race. Because, you know, if you love what you do, then that's great. And if you're a musician and maybe you're a session drummer or session musician and you love it, why quit? Escaping the rat race for you might just be creating a pension, having a second income or a part-time you know, job on the side or setting up an e-commerce business or selling some merch or having a pop portfolio. A lot of people in Progressive who have a property portfolio, they do it part-time to build a pension. So that's number one because you know, there's a lot of people that say, oh, well, if you've got a job, you're a loser. Well, not, if you've got a job that you love, you should keep it. You've just got to work out what your part-time Side hustle, as the Americans call it. So that's number one. Some, and by the way, some people are not the right personality for an entrepreneur. You know, some people like to be told what to do. They like to follow a system. They want the security and safety. And if that, you're that kind of person, let go of the dream. Um, or do it on the side in your bedroom part-time and work on the computer. But the reality is some people are not made to be entrepreneurs. Um, step two, then, is if you know in your heart you are made to be an entrepreneur, you do one of the following two or three things. Number, I think the smartest play is to set a future date in the future between six and 24 months in the future where you're planning to leave work. And so then what you do is you set an, a target income. So let's say you earn five grand a month at the moment. Well, you probably waste a grand, let's be honest, and you could probably reduce your expenses a bit. So you could probably get to three and a half grand a month, replace that income, and then you can leave your job. And you've got to give yourself the timeline. Um, Parkinson's law sort of states that, you know, time and space will open and shut according to, you know, what, what you fill it with and the deadlines and the time that you have. So the longer the timeline you give yourself, the less you'll do and the more you'll fill it with unimportant tasks. The more of a, a hard deadline you put on, the more you'll fill it with important tasks and, and empty unimportant tasks. Um, I've, I've written a whole chapter on gaming yourself in my new book, which is how to, how to game yourself and trick yourself into hard deadlines so you get your important tasks done. Okay. Um, and one of the, so I've, I've got um, 15 book critics coming over in one week, to, or I'm paying their expenses to come and sit in that room over there and critic my book for two days. That's a hard deadline. And that's going to cost me a lot of money, and I'm going to look stupid if I haven't finished the book by then. And that's been forcing me to write five or six chapters a day. And if I hadn't had the hard deadline, I wouldn't write the book. So you need your hard deadline for leaving your job six to 24 months away. Then of course you need your income target set. Then you need to go and work out what the right strategy is for you to earn the income. Is it property? Is it e-commerce? Is it doing something online, you know, with information, publishing, marketing, whether it's books or products? It's easy than ever to get information out there through podcasts and YouTube videos and that kind of thing. Or, or have you got any other skills? Do you want to be a musician? You know, whatever it else, whatever else it is. Uh, and then you've got to get to work and you've got to get the evenings, the weekends, nick the times at lunch, you know, try and get a, you know, maybe you can scale your work back over time, go down to four days, go down to three days so you can do it in a, in a progressive manner. The alternative is to hand your notice in and then go and work it out on the way. And as they say, jump off and then pull your parachute later. And um, you know what? For some people, that is definitely wrong. Mm -hmm. But for some people, that's the only way you're getting out of the job. And I, that I was forced into that because I was fired. But I was going to leave anyway. Uh, and it was a real um, blessing in disguise getting fired because um, Mark and I were planning to set up Progressive, but Mark was just taking so long. <laughs> and so we got fired, which was great. I was actually doing a reality TV show in St Albans. Um, and I was away in like this big mansion for six weeks. Right. And while I was away, we got fired and Mark had to take all the shit while I was on the TV show and he wasn't. So, he, so not only did I get us fired, but Mark had to deal with all the crap while I was doing this, well, look at me TV show. Um, and I came back at the end of December and then Progressive was incorporated in January. 
Now, if, we, if, we, if that hadn't happened, we might have waited six months a year uh, and, um, you know, that business got into troubles and we might have been involved in that. Mark openly, openly admits, you know, he, he might have taken two years to leave. So it's taking that. Yeah. First. So thanks for tuning in on the live. I hope you've enjoyed it. And um, stay tuned for more lives. And remember, if you don't risk anything, you risk everything. <laughs>